Hey everyone, and welcome to the Online Ocean Symposium. Earth Day is a couple of days away, and in honor of the holiday, we are going to be holding a very special hangout. Today we are talking to a bunch of artists who are activists, or commonly known apparently as artivists, um, and we're going to be talking about their art, how it inspires and forms, and how it actually creates conservation. In this hangout, we'll be chatting with these artists, again, about their work and their inspiration, but really we're going to be looking at some of the awesome work that they've produced, uh, specifically around very important issues like conservation in the ocean. Uh, keep in mind that those of you at home can actually ask us questions directly through the Google Hangout window or through YouTube. Just click on the Q&A button and ask away. First up is an artist and activist, National Geographic Emerging Explorer, Asher. Asher, welcome back to the program. How's it going? Great. How are you? Uh, not too shabby. It's a kind of foggy day here in San Francisco. How's it going where you are? Pretty sunny and bright out. Just spend the morning running around town. I mean, it's chillier today than yesterday, so... Well, I'm absolutely jealous. Uh, you are a creative conservationist and hold the title of National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Uh, what do you see as the relationship between art and conservation? Um, for me, I've always been aware of the impact of art, and I don't believe in doing art for art's sake simply because I don't think we can afford to live a life that's disengaged from the larger fabric of existence and be oblivious of the many realities currently assailing the planet because our well-being and welfare is directly and inextricably connected to the welfare of wild and natural resources. So. I think everything that I create definitely has to cast a light on that simply because I don't think I would be able to look myself in the mirror tomorrow morning if I didn't do what I do. Um, wow. so I think it's just a matter of taking responsibility, feeling the need to communicate the relevant stories of our time in the most relatable manner in a vocabulary that's accessible to the lay person, uh, bridging the gap between scientific data that's being disseminated and uh, the corporate entities that are actively exploiting the, the natural resources that co the collective um, is dependent on. Well, one series that you worked on uh, really hit home with me, and that was your uh, series in red. Can you talk a little bit about it? I'm going to bring up some of it. I just want to learn sure. a little bit about your process, what inspired you. So what am I looking at here? So the entire collection was inspired by my uh, field visits to the Serengeti last year and I learned that we're clearing well over 400,000 acres of forest land annually uh, to produce charcoal and that's the primary fuel source for over 90% of Tanzanian households that live off-grid. So Tanapa does not uh, provide the uh, I mean, not Tanapa, Tanasco does not provide the energy requirements for all of these houses. And since they rely on uh, charcoal, it results in the uh, denudation of habitat range for ma the majority of species that people go on safari for, leopards, cheetahs, um, lions, elephants, every, anything that you would expect to find in Africa would basically be ha ha will have no space to inhabit if we continue perpetrating this trade. And uh, for that to be resolved effectively, what we, re what we would need to do is provide uh, clean energy in a manner that is portable or decentralized. So it cannot come from a central uh, energy grid source because so many of these houses are settlements that just pop up and um, most of these communities cannot afford uh, high, like um, extremely expensive um, energy sources. So it has to be like solar power panels that are, um, you know, disseminated as stickers or it has to be innovative solutions that are low cost and efficient as well as effective in addressing their energy needs. So this entire series basically is created with charcoal as the medium so that it will cast a light on this issue. And I often rely on the on the medium to tell the story too. So it's not always the conceptual depth in terms of information overlays. It's also the materials itself that can do the uh, talking for you as an artist. Can you talk a little bit more about your process? You just mentioned that you like the materials to kind of tell the story itself. Um, you know what 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 actually inspires you? Uh, when you're creating to use, say, charcoal to talk about a charcoal issue? Um, so when I'm looking at a story, I'm looking at how many different aspects of it need to get communicated in a single 
layout. So the composition is entirely determined by the complexity of the narrative that I'm trying to disclose. And if the, if the story can be broken down into numerous images, then I look to a larger narrative arc and I disseminate campaigns over time so that it, ha it has a build-on effect and people get the entire picture over a course of a year as opposed to uh, having an over-cluttered, uh, visually unfocused uh, story that's being broken in a way where people just don't know how to take it back into their lives and apply it. So for me it's really driven towards having an end impact. So if it, even if it's a singular call to action and just getting them to understand that every tusk costs a life, every horn costs a life, that's that's just one aspect of the story. It doesn't cover the terror aspect where the trade in weapons and arms is linked to the illicit trade in contraband. So I, I constantly find ways in which I can um, visually uh, bring you know distill the entire dialogue into the fewest number of iconic elements so it's like looking at the silhouettes that will in a glimpse transfer the gist of the narrative um, and I usually rely on a positive and negative space to disclose the story so it's finding the the symbols that will relate to that particular culture so if you encounter a certain color constantly in in that particular uh, geographical location then you'll have ob ob like obvious mnemonic relationships with that hue. So you're going to immediately recall, if I show you a certain shade of red in American markets, you're going to immediately recall Coca-Cola, for instance, and I can use that to my advantage. So I'm looking at ways in which I can build um, it on the vocabulary that's already inherent to the mass market. And so if you look at packaging, I look at you know uh, advertising spots that are currently on display. I look to what people are wearing on their backs, patterns that are trending, textures that are being related to, um, because people want to have a tactile, immersive experience, so when I look to creating an image, I really do rely on as much synesthetic input as possible prior to visualizing anything. Um, and often, like, you know, any artist will tell you this, like, basics of art, you know, if you look at a line, a single line can have such emphasis on a piece of paper, so depending on where you start your focal point, uh, whether you lay that line horizontally and then build the entire work on a horizontal composition, which means it's an arresting state, creating a level of static, um, like a stillness within which the viewer is trapped for a brief pause so they can actually look to um, assimilating that information. Because the problem with the world right now is that we're constantly in movement and the manic momentum is preventing us from really looking at and therefore owning and addressing the issues at hand. So the works that I create are very static simply so that it will get people to, stay, to take pause, to stop for a moment there and really think about what's happening in the world around them and how their daily choices are resulting in, in those impacts. And um, some of the works that I create also are visually very attuned to the cultural consciousness and the way in which uh, illustrative styles play a role in that culture. So these images, Pandas of Africa, is to get the Chinese to extend their empathy and pride that they have reserved to protecting pandas in China toward African wildlife. And it's illustrated in sort of an anime style because that immediately emanates with that market. And uh, it became viral simply because of the fact that it was produced in a manner that is, is something that they relate to and it empowers Chinese voices to take a stand for this issue. It's something very second nature to them. So, uh, so the different ways in which I, I apply visual tactics and strategies to like get people to relate to content. So, uh, as you mentioned, you know this image that I'm showing currently is about is part of a uh, outreach effort specifically geared towards Asiatic communities about pandas and uh, and elephants. Uh, you've worked on issues such as the ivory ivory trade, the plight of big cats, world's plastic pro problems. Uh, what's a major campaign that you're working on right now? Uh, right now I'm working more on the stockpiles and crushed ivory, um, so I just got up a call in regards to that and I'm trying to really figure out a way in which um, we can incentivize um, different countries to step up and cremate their stockpiles, but I mean cremation is really not a viable solution because burning ivory is not energy efficient and it's not something that most countries are even equipped to do. So we're trying to find active solutions that can be put into place, but we do need to address what's happening, which is not just the demand aspect of it, but also empowering Africans to understand what they're losing for all time to come, that future generations of Africans will not have access to those natural resources such as elephants and rhinos. And also the critical role some of these species play in ecosystems that are currently a certain way, which will, which will no longer be the case if they're unplugged from that that tapestry of life. So, for instance, you will see the entire savanna change dramatically if the elephant's missing from it, because they are constant gardeners. They do curate the 
the way in which seed dispersal happens in that area and what trees take root, what trees don't. So if if we continue to decimate, uh, mm. like you know, decimate the uh, population of elephants there, we're going to result in a complete collapse of the ecosystem as we know it. Um, so they are a critical species to protect. And I'm also working on another series that's partially funded by National Geographic called Beyond the Frame and Focus. I took a series of photographs in the Serengeti last year, which is sort of like deadpan tourist photo ops, um, which you know anybody with a good camera could click an image of a leopard or a rhino or an elephant. Uh, but the problem is you leave the country thereafter and you have no res moral responsibility or any further connection to that landscape or to that animal. So it's like you get the photo op, but you're not paying the true price of what it means to see that lion or elephant in the wild today. Because an extensive amount of resources have to be allocated, and also there's a cost, constant like cost-benefit analysis that they play, keeping that animal alive. If not, somebody else will come and cull it. You know, so it's a constantly wor worrying about the economics behind the ecosystem and the wildlife. Um, so that's sort of what I will be portraying by eating into these images using multimedia uh, to create a larger story. So what's actually beyond that frame that's in focus um, that people need to understand in order to feel involved and emotionally able to act. Well, it's really great that you're, uh, you know, drawing attention to both the ivory issue again and, you know, about the actual focus uh, both in the places you have been and bringing that uh, attention to where you have been to larger audiences. Uh, and, um, one last thing is also, um, in regards, since it's the Ocean Symposium, I am working on oceans issues as well, I'm not completely marginalizing it, because I realize it's all interlinked um, and results in climate change. If we don't protect our world's oceans, we are kind of screwed. Um, so I think the other aspect of what I'm doing is on plastics. So I'm working on a proposal with uh, David Gruber, who's a marine biologist, and we're coming up with a um, way in which we can address the plastics issue and how that's impacting the world's oceans, because it's becoming a large dumping ground, especially with the um, Marine gyres. Um, mm -hmm. It's that is a huge issue, and that's one that uh, we here at the symposium have definitely been working on uh, for quite a while, and are very interested in seeing what you uh, come up with and develop with David. Um, next up is the amazing Courtney Madison, who is a ocean artivist. Courtney, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, you work in ceramics. Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Yes. Um, I basically hand build really large scale coral reef and other marine ecosystem inspired um, sculptural installations. So I can actually screen share and show you some slides um, that show a little bit about my building process. Um, this is sort of a shot from my studio. I work in Denver, Colorado, about as far from the ocean as you can get in America. Um, so I work in my inland sea studio and I coil build lots of um, hollow coral forms um, and just hand build like every single branch and um, all the different pieces that go into these larger installations. Um, so these are just some progress shots that I can show you. Um, and I use really simple tools like um, chopsticks and paintbrushes and um, kind of dissecting tools, whatever I can um, use to get the textures that I want. Um, and then eventually they result in large scale installations. Um, like this one is my one of my most recent um, large scale pieces that I finished that's kind of made in the way that I just showed you. That's the main image at your uh, website, isn't it, currently? Yes, yeah. So when you're making these, are you using like a visual reference? Are you actually using photos or actual examples of coral? I know you've dove before, right? Yes, I'm a scuba diver. A lot of my background is in marine conservation biology and policy, so um, I grew up uh, along the California coast, just exploring tide pools and whale watching, and then I got scuba certified after high school and um, have been diving kind of all over the world. So I always take a camera with me when I go diving, and I don't usually publish my photos, but I often will just plaster them all over my studio walls so that I can use them as inspiration when I'm sculpting. So I've actually seen some of your pieces in real life, and I got to admit that they're very lifelike. And you know, some portions of them, uh, especially like the uh, you've done a piece, if I recall, with like two worms and stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. they even feel live at times. Uh, is, is there a purpose to that effect? Was that an effect you were trying to go for? I'm glad you feel like they're alive because 
um, it's sometimes something I struggle with, with um, such a kind of sedentary material, like ceramic is so rigid and brittle that um, I try really hard to make everything look like it's really soft and undulating and kind of gelatinous uh, to be similar to real life, you know, anemone tentacles and coral bodies. Um, and that's something I try to do because I basically want to use my work to bring the beauty and peril of coral reefs and other marine ecosystems above the surface and into view for people that often don't get the opportunity or the luxury to explore real living marine ecosystems for themselves. So every one of us is connected to the ocean and um, I just want to emphasize that and kind of get people emotionally connected to sea creatures because I am and um, I fell in love with coral reef organisms at a really young age and uh, it's because I got to experience them firsthand and kind of realize how alien and exotic and amazing their forms are and their relationships with one another and the way they grow and move. So that's why I want to save them and I feel like if my work can evoke those feelings in viewers then it could inspire other people to want to save them also. Well, that's fantastic. It actually answers one of my next questions about what is so attractive about ocean life and why do you like working on it. Um, so it actually puts me in a spot to come up with a new question for you. Uh, you've been working on a number of different ocean related topics and themes like one of your main themes is our changing seas. Another one you actually look at uh, what's known as hope spots or areas in the ocean that are deemed by mainly Sylvia or, uh, Earle's organization as areas of, uh, of interest for protection. Uh, how do you choose your subject matter uh, and your themes? So my main goal with all my work is to get people emotionally connected to the ocean because you protect what you care about and we care about what we're familiar with, what we know and understand. So if my work can get people more familiar with the ocean and um, particularly benthic ecosystems and habitats that a lot of people don't usually pay attention to, um, then that's what I want to do because I think that a lot of the most amazing creatures in the ocean are often overlooked um, because, you know, the sharks are swimming by or the big colorful fish or whatever. Um, Nemo is nearby so you get distracted and look for Nemo, but um, to me the invertebrates, kind of these faceless creatures um, are the most beautiful and um, kind of seductive um, aesthetically and so I um, chose the Hope Spot series because I wanted to kind of diversify my work. I mostly build coral reef organisms and that's kind of shown through my Art Changing Seas series that really focuses on the threats facing coral reefs. So basically climate change, ocean acidification, overfishing, and nutrient pollution. And then as I have you know, studied coral reefs and the threats that they face, I have learned that those threats and others really are impacting the ocean as a whole, and I've kind of grown to care about lots of other ecosystems as I've learned more about them as well. So the Hope Spot series, which I'm developing right now, so I'll have lots more photos on my website, in the next year of those, but they basically um, show selections of lots of different ecosystems from all over the world's ocean, so under ice sheets and deep sea thermal vents and all these crazy places that aren't kind of in the shallow, warm, tropical seas that I'm used to kind of portraying. Totally gotcha. Uh, before I move on, uh, what's your favorite piece or do you have a favorite piece that you've made? Um, I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to experiment with what imagery is most effective in terms of inspire, inspiring people to care and um, sort of being aesthetically powerful in terms of my work. So uh, the one I'm most proud of right now is my Art Changing Seas 3 piece, which is, I can show you. Um, here it is on my website. It's the homepage of my website. But this work I completed last year 
um, in March 2014, and it's about 10 feet high and 14 feet wide, and it's completely hand-built ceramic, um, and it comes off the wall about uh, 22 inches. And to me, this is kind of the most effective I've found my work to be because it seems like people understand it without me explaining it, which is something I struggle with. So a lot of people don't know about coral bleaching, but they've probably heard of it. And so I feel like this piece is kind of the closest I've gotten to um, expressing kind of the beauty and peril of a coral reef at the same time. So that's what I'm proud of. I'm sure it'll change, hopefully. I hope I can come up with something uh, even more effective in the near future. I'm working on a couple new series, too. Well, that's great to hear. You know, honestly, that, that piece is really striking. And on the symposium, we had a uh, ocean acidification hangout a while back where we talked a bit about coral bleaching and how to express and how to uh, educate the public and be clear about what the meaning is, what's actually happening, and really your piece there is just this perfect, perfect visceral feeling uh, that, you know, just portrays the concept really, really efficiently and effectively. So really fantastic piece and really excited to see more and more of your work as, as it develops. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Mara, uh, Mara Hazeltine. 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 Sorry about that. Um, who works on some amazing and fantastic artwork. Welcome to the Hangout. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, pleasure to be here. So, um, on your website it says, uh, art that addresses the link between our cultural and biological evolution. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, so, um, uh, all of my work pretty much um, is based, except for actually my most recent pieces in um, science. Um, so um, I, I actually, that tagline came from a book by a cancer researcher um, who wrote this book, uh, Bridge to the Future, um, Bioethics, A Bridge to the Future in the 70s. So a lot of my information um, has come from, um, you know, atmospheric scientists and thinkers from the 70s. And he actually was um, named Von Renzler Pottier, and uh, he made this, uh, basically he made a, an equation between um, how our cultural and biological evolution and, and this concept of bioethics had to accelerate um, very, very fast to deal with population growth. So um, I felt that as an artist, um, how, how did... Um, my role in society fit fit into um, evolving because we could evolve, you know, um, in a, in a multitude of ways. We could, uh, you know, become extinct, which you know is looking um, more likely every day. Uh, we could evolve so that you know the Kardashians are living in Dubai and uh, everybody else is sort of you know um, trying to get water and and fresh air, or we could have you know, uh, evolve so that we share the planet and maybe that means we don't jet set around as much. Um, and that really has to do with uh, bioethics. And so um, whatever I do with my work, it um, is directly related to that. And I have I've actually uh, was working with um, an atmospheric scientist and marine biologist named Tom Garreau at the UN who's head of the Global Coral Reef Alliance, which I'm part of. And he taught me this word, geotherapy. And that was also something that Von Renzler Pottier and Richard Grantham um, tried to coin in this um, treatise they wrote, which is um, the Declaration of Geotherapy, which is was written by a panel of scientists in 1991 in Lyon, France. and. Um, we're trying to get this word into the public lexicon, and it's basically a, a call to action uh, for people to take care of the planet, do bioremediation. But it was it was sort of they were saying all scientists should think about that, but I actually think that all people should think about this concept of geotherapy and um, caring for their planet themselves. You know just little things like uh, picking up trash and so 
as artists, I feel like, you know, uh, we're sort of like these sensitive cultural antennas. And um, we, we're sort of outside society and inside society at the same time. And so uh, we can reflect what's going on um, in the world around us. And for me, the, the, the issue that trumps all issues is, is climate change. Um, so I'm hoping that we can um, accelerate our evolution. Uh, you know, otherwise we're going to go extinct, and um, you know the planet will re-evolve without us, and that might be even more beautiful. Who knows? So. You know, in talking about um, basically what sounds like is a concept of stewardship um, and being good stewards of the planet in any way possible. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between fine art and environmentalism in your work? Um, what's the difference between functional work and restoring reefs and work meant for gallery and how are those two things related, if at all? Yeah, so um, in the past uh, eight years or so, I've been um, doing um, kind of like I just started a third body of work, which um, hopefully we'll talk about uh, at the end of this. But um, I've been doing two two main things. One is the sort of um, a lot of science and teaching about uh, sustainable reef restoration methods that do not use plastic or concrete and are meant to be sort of like a poultice on the planet. And um, so I've been working a lot in New York with oysters, and I have designed a lot of reefs. Um, for coral, I studied um, reef restoration in Indonesia, um, and um, and a lot of my work actually uh, stems from this in-depth study of um, the microscopic world and its connection to the megascopic world, and how uh, you know the atmosphere is controlled by um, plankton and um, that sequestering carbon dioxide and giving us oxygen and what happens if planktonic ecosystems are disrupted. So a lot of my reef structures um, are also sort of meant to be awareness pieces, but they're in this, uh, my mother grew up in, in Japan, so, and I've, I've worked in Japan and in Okinawa before, and um, so I have this uh, deep-rooted, um, I, I guess I'm a, a Shintoist in a way, so um, there's this whole cycle of life and rebirth, so like with the Shinto temple, they'll build a wooden temple and um, they don't uh, treat it at all and it will just decay and then they build a new one and so the reefs are supposed to be like that, like hopefully they will flourish and um, in a hundred years you won't even know that an artist was there, um, it'll just be a healthy ecosystem and I started working with oysters um, about 10 years ago in New York. Primarily, I was attracted to uh, the fact that they can filter up to 55 gallons of water per day. And um, this idea that, you know, New York had 350 square miles of, of reef and to uh, rebuild it um, would, you know, establish a keystone species which would clean the harbor and so it, that's kind of like this selfless, like, oh, so here's some science experiments uh, of different substrates, and then I, like, spat. So these, this is uh, all these oysters having, like, a little oyster orgy on my substrates. I don't know if you can see that very clearly. but And then that's a spat, um, spatted substrate, so those are all baby oysters uh, growing on it. So that was, that, that, uh, the whole project is sort of just like, you know, I've been doing it um, almost for free or for very little money for years and years, and I keep going back to it. I almost get it dragged into it, because now there's a lot of money in oysters um, since Hurricane Sandy, so there's a lot of real estate turf wars, and uh, I call it oyster wars here in New York, but um, anyway, that's a whole other story. But those functional things, I think, are more like performance art, and... Um, so they're performative pieces, and they're they're meant to grow and be alive and and heal. Whereas um, I then I started making. Um, I, I think I gave you a slide of this. I, I started. I, I went around the world and 
started collecting uh, plankton samples um, because I wanted to make reefs in the shape of plankton all over the place. Um, so that would sort of highlight the plankton of that area. And in the meantime, I found uh, microscopic, when I looked through the microscope, I found microscopic uh, pieces of plastic in all of my water samples. And that was just the pollution that I could see with my eyes through the microscope. So, you know, obviously there was like a lot, there's a lot more pollution there. And some of the places were like extremely remote, like um, this oasis I was on um, in Siwa, Egypt, uh, only population 3,000, had a salt lake, incredible plankton, um, but also has plastic in it. And so um, I got incredibly sad about this, um, and I realized it was sort of like it was sort of like looking into your own body, or because we're all made of water, and realizing that you're sick and dying because the planet is sick and dying, and uh, from the plastic. So I started making this, these pieces, which were incredibly toxic. Um, I was really inspired by Alexander McQueen, Savage Love, and making the stuff that was like totally disturbed, but totally exquisite. Um, are, are these the um, kind of neon green and purple uh, pieces that you're, you, you were working on? Yes, yeah, so, uh, wow. so I started this uh, series called La Boheme, and I, I, I was inspired by the glass blowing techniques of the Balashkas, um in a uh, uh, turn of the century. And um, so uh, the, the glowing green is actually uranium infused glass, so it has, it's slightly radioactive and it's ensnared in plastic. And the plastic is like super gnarled and uh, I worked with like a, a professional distresser and we, you know, we really made it look like it had been in the ocean and, and then so, um, I started thinking about how, you know, the way that I felt when I when I saw this plastic in the water was like the way that Rodolfo felt in, in La Boheme when he's sort of realizing that Mimi has consumption um, his love and she's dying. So um, I, I often try to bring in a human element um, uh, to the work so um, people can relate to it. So, I mean, it's, it's totally absurd and surrealistic, but... Um, I have my friend Joseph Bartning, we do live performances and I've made a film of it, um, sing Che Gaida Manina, when he, why is your little hand so cold, to Mimi, who's like dying of consumption, um, but is in fact like a tintinid plankton that I found when I was on board uh, this ship called Tara Oceans, which has mm -hmm. uh, taught me a huge amount about... Um, atmospheric climate change and how plankton is, uh, you know, just as important as the rainforest and sequestering carbon dioxide and ocean acidification is affecting that. Um, but anyway, so she sort of looks like this champagne glass, but I, I made the body look like a damsel in distress and um, it glows under a black light and she's dying. And, you know, she dies at the end of La Boheme. It's not a pretty story. So I kind of, like, you know, I, I realized that there was this sort of way in which you could sort of, like, capture the dark side of, of this this stuff. And um, so, yeah, I went to the dark side. So the, the research was, like, the light side. And the, the, the this series is really, like, uh, absurd, beautiful, yeah, totally disturbing. So if I can go back to this piece right here that you're describing, um, this area right here is supposed to represent plastic? Yeah, so that's like... Mm -hmm. I, Interesting. I, I, it's I, very... I, it's, I see a slide that was like um, all these uh, plankton with microplastic uh, strands uh, that I captured in Okinawa. So it, it, it almost looks organic in a way. It almost looks... Yeah. Like a, like muscle fiber or something like that, um, and it's this very great contrast between this rigid and ragged uh, aspects. You got the uh, glass that, you know, that's smooth, sharp, and very geometric, and then you got more of the uh, the organic feel to the to what's supposed to be a inorganic material. 
it's just a very interesting piece. Uh, what are you hoping that somebody who witnesses this piece or the live performance walks away from it with? Well, I mean, the, the last line um, of the little film, art film that I made about it was that, it, you know, uh, Rodolfo sort of going like this and like, he looks so upset because he realizes that she's going to die of, you know, in, uh, of TB, but our consumption. But is that we are all Rodolfo, we are all Mimi, meaning like we're all made of light and energy, as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, you know, we're just stardust embodied, and um, the planet and us and even rocks and rivers and it's all the same thing. We're in this incredible living biosphere, like not every planet has it. And uh, so, so I just wanted to sort of like tie in like we're made of water, this plankton is like so alien and different from us, but it's actually this, we're all tied together. And the more I learn about um, biology and um, atmospheric science, the more I realize that, you know, I, I follow Lovelock's theory of the Gaia hypothesis that we are on the in sentient biosphere. And, um, you know, the, the biosphere is just going to eradicate us if we continue, continue to act like a cancer upon it. So... Um, it's sort of like that that realization I wanted people to feel. So it's like incredibly emotive, and especially in the live performances, um, you know, like, I mean, Joseph's voice, he sounds like a young Pavarotti. So it's like, you know. Yeah. If you can't even, I wanted people, even if they can't relate to the fact that our planet is sick and dying, they can relate to getting their heart broken, right? Like, we all have, after a certain age, hopefully, if we have a heart, it's been broken, so... I, I totally understand what you're going with there. You know, especially if you look at it from, you know, the love between he, what should be between humanity and our ecosystem, and, you know, both humanity is the heartbreaker and the heartbreaky in that situation. Um, your work is very, very intriguing, very evocative, and it definitely brings about a lot of different emotions in the viewer, and you know, creates these opportunities for for the viewer to get into this mindset of both the scientific aspects, the microbiology of it. You know, where it's almost like a walking into a Dali situation that's oriented around um, uh, conservation. Um, so I, I really want to thank you for uh, sharing your work on the program and talking about your items in, in depth. At this point, I think it would be great for us to field a question from the audience, um, if that's okay with you guys, because I think it's it's very poignant for people who are working on art that has to do specifically with the environment and trying to provide a uh, an impact or create an impact or create an emotional response in, in the viewer, it seems like there's probably also going to be an emotional response in the person making the art. The question is from uh, Jennifer Santa Anna, uh, and it's asking if you could talk, if the panelists could talk about any feelings they have when working on their art. Does it cause angst, anxiety, or do you just get into a creative mindset? Uh, Asher, I'd love to hear your perspective on this for, first, then we'll go to Courtney, and then back to Mara. Um, does it feed any anxiety? I don't know. I feel like, for me, it's a very uh, irrational process, because it comes from a very emotionally reactive space, and so I learn about something, and then it comes out of me through one emotion or another, whether it's anger or depression or just bawling for hours on end about something that's happening in our world. And once I get affected by it, I begin to see, you know, different articles and, and input from various people and, and coalesces into its own thing. And it just, I serve as a decanter. Everything pours through me and it comes out in the way it does uh, as a layout. It's a finished product by the time I'm finished dealing with the entire crisis um, that becomes who I am. It's like I, I just go through this like state of being possessed by the problem at hand. 
um, and, and, and the loss becomes so palpable. I feel it on such a cellular level that it's uh, from a deeply personal space, which is why uh, when I create something, it's, you know, it comes from having had a certain epiphany that connects me to the issue, and then I want to evoke that same epiphany in yet others who view the work, and they, thereby extend that emotional empathy as, as part of our cultural fabric. Um, so that everybody comes uh, approaches that uh, that concern or that species or that um, terrestrial or marine landscape uh, or waterscape with that same level of uh, you know deep personal understanding and empathy. Gotcha, Courtney. What about you? Uh, what type of emotions go through you when you are working on your ceramic pieces? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the issues themselves cause me a lot of anxiety, particularly climate change and ocean acidification, because I'm thinking about them constantly, about how they're affecting coral reefs and causing bleaching and stuff like that. So that causes me anxiety, and then my work feels therapeutic in a way. It feels uh, like a way for me to kind of heal that um, within myself. But also, my work takes so long to make um, for these big installations that I do, so it you know spans whatever emotion I'm feeling that day because it can take me an entire year to make an installation. So sometimes I'll come to the studio and I'm feeling aggressive, and you know ceramic sculpture can be good for that because you can just beat up a whole bunch of clay and you know make something really huge. And then other times I feel very delicate, and so I just sort of do really tiny detail work and. Usually my installations incorporate a good mix of those things, so excuse the cat whiskers. <laughs> um, <laughs> my cat's behind me. I thought it was just an interactive art piece. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's a good mix of emotion kind of built into my work, and my mood can really affect kind of what I do that day. But um, overall, it's really therapeutic for me. It's, I love it. If I don't sculpt, you know, at least a couple days a week, I feel like something's missing. So good to hear, uh, Mara. What about you? Um, I guess the best way to describe it is um, there's there was this monk, uh, and he wrote a a book. It was right before uh, the Renaissance, um, Theophilus Presbyter, and it was really just a handbook on like how to gild candles and stuff, but he, he talks about how uh, making things is his way of, of, of worshiping God, and I worship the goddess nature, so it's my way of worship. Uh, and it's, 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 it's really like Courtney said, just the meditative aspect of making something with my hands is so calming to me that... Um, I just get into that process, and I, I can like when I really get into it, I could I could lose track of time, and that's when I'm happiest is these moments where there is no uh, time. You know, that that's a very that's a very uh, apt description. I, I want to ask everybody because that almost sounds like you get into almost say, a, a a Zen. Uh, aspect when you're making stuff where time doesn't really exist and you know everything besides you and what you're working on doesn't really exist. Uh, w would you say that's kind of a accurate description of what you're going with there? Yeah, yeah. In Hindi, it's uh, karma yoga. Hmm. Would would you would, would the rest of the panel agree that that's kind of a similar state that you kind of get into? Yeah, it's, it's it's like a weird high, you know. Once you get like taken in by your creative process, you just go into a weird meditative space, which is why I don't actively need to seek out meditation or yoga or anything. I think any creative will agree to that. Like once you start getting into that thing, it just starts flowing out of you and you fall into this pattern, this rhythm of being, and it's like I don't know, it's the, it's the best kind of high there is in the world. I think that's why we don't need much else from the world around us. We yeah. Don't take the gift. Gordon, you agree? It's true. I totally agree. My work is really physical, so it's kind of a full body experience. I don't really need to go to yoga or meditate, just like Asher said. I mean, it's just, um, yeah, I mean, it's good for you. It's an amazing feeling. Well, um, I, I, I'd have to ask, like, uh, you know, I, I kind of brought this up with Mara, but I would love to hear from all of you. What do you want your audience to? the people you create your art for, what are like what, some of the key messages that you want them to walk away from 
with your art. Courtney says, I still got it on you. Let's let's start with you on that one. So, yeah, I kind of said it before, but, um, I mean, I feel like I want people to walk away with a deeper understanding of, or just kind of a spark of curiosity about how they relate to the ocean and how it's important to them. So um, when a viewer sees my work, I want them to be able to interpret it their own way. And so that's, kind of, that's partly why I make um, really large installations is because I like how people can kind of find their own spot in the piece and, you know, discover details that other people might not see and um, kind of discover a quasi-ocean ecosystem uh, in the gallery. Gotcha. Mara, what about you? Uh, say the question again, I suppose. <laughs> no, it's all fine. Uh, what, uh, what do you want your audience, the people that you make your art for, what, what is the key messages that you want them to be able to walk away from your pieces with? Um, well, I, w I, I want them to um, take uh, better care of their bodies uh, and drink more water so that they can clean water and I think I, my, my main goal is to purify water. So that's my main goal in life, and I think science, learning about the beauty and wonder of science teaches people to care for themselves and what's around them more, and so I want people to take care of our water-based planet, basically. And um, whatever the, in whatever way they, that they can, you know? Gotcha. So, I, I guess I just want people to care more and be more self-aware. All right. Well, I, those are some really great perspectives. Uh, Asher? Um, I think for me it's like I, I, I think I, when, I, when I encounter uh, anything that's happening in the world around me, once I'm able to assume responsibility for it, from there on it's sort of just an intrinsic flow. And I feel like, you know, whatever pours out is, is what – is relevant to the culture around me because it's like so influenced by the world around. Everything pours in and out. It's sort of like a, a symbiosis and an osmosis with the world around me and with how it reaches people thereafter because it's so reflective of everything that they've given me that, that comes back to them. Um, so it's very cyclical. I think it's like very, you know, close loop. And I look at it as one system, as one holistic way of interacting. Um, so I don't really see a conscious process of like, you know, the artist, the art, and then the viewer. It's sort of all part of the same dialogue. Um, and it's all process. And it keeps feeding back into more. Um, so then that channels into the next work. I see what impact that has had. I, you know, and also my, my work constantly relates to metrics that I actually have to pay attention to, like, you know, quantitative out input and output. So if we're setting certain benchmarks before we release a campaign, then it has to hit those numbers. It has to hit, um, you know, whether it's in terms of consumer behavior that we're addressing, change in perception, um, um, or if we are looking to get people to take ownership of the, of the species in their backyard, whatever it is that we're going after, uh, we need to make sure that we hit those um, metrics. So for me, it's like an interesting process of like learning what works and then bringing that back um, and, and evolving it for the next campaign forward. So that sounds great. I mean, you know, this actually brings me to my next question, which is, uh, you know, part of the whole topic of this entire conversation has been about art and its impact on conservation, and part of that has to be in regards to the political discussion because in the end things like climate change, things like uh, conservation through resources and resource protection and making sure that we aren't just uh, using our international economic machine to just take over everything and make sure that there's nothing left. Uh, part of the purpose of the work that you all do from what I understand is to also engage in the political discussion. Um, Mara actually had a something that she wanted to mention in regards to this, and I was wondering if you could uh, uh, jump into that now. Okay, sure. So um, I was um, I was I was actually you know when uh, Andrew said, "Oh, well, 
it's really on the eve of Earth Day. Um, what is? Would you guys talk about that a little bit? Um, I I sort of you know I never really questioned what what was Earth Day? Uh, why did it start? And um, so I started reading a little bit about it, and I thought it was super interesting in um, relationship to what is going on like right now. And I wanted to kind of um, bring that up and then um, try to recruit um, Asher and Courtney to help me. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, uh, Earth Day was uh, first established, um, you know, uh, in 1969 um, when there was a lot of uh, people were really, you know, in, in an, um, as a peace day by a guy named John Mc McConnell. Um, so it was first, uh, you know, celebrated on the spring equinox um, in 1970, and there was a lot of, you know, students um, who are activists, and, and it was a, it was a peace day. So I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson from Wisconsin changed it into Earth Day, um, which was celebrated on the 22nd because that was after spring break and more students could get involved and he was um, super involved with um, education and he wanted it to be a national teaching. So it's really, it's really a solstice celebration which makes me happy and it has its um, roots in, in the peace movement and um, then uh, you know, it was also in conjunction with UNESCO and sort of was the founding um, you know, founded the whole UN uh, series of Kyoto Protocol meetings and, uh, you know, we've all heard of the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference and Rio and then most recently Lima and coming up is um, COP21 and actually, um, you know, so I know, I know, uh, you know, we marched here in um, Last last fall, and we had 400,000 people. Uh, Rio was a really big deal. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol has made a difference. However, I, I do feel that we've been, uh, as a movement, uh, really suppressed by the mass media. And um, you know, uh, the the 400,000 people that marched last fall. Um, it was only on the news in the states for five minutes. Same thing with Rio. Like people were, I was hearing news about it from people in other countries more than in the states. Um, you know, I, I've been hearing you know a lot of stuff about you know the environmental movement. Like, well, it's a top-down issue. No, it's a bottom-up issue. You know, but it really, it's an everybody issue. And so. Um, now we're having um, on June 29th. There's going to be another big sort of meeting with the UN, and and the goal is really really simple with um, COP21, and that's you know that uh, we don't want to raise uh, above two degrees Celsius. So how can countries become uh, more renewable, more uh, uh, you know efficient, and um, so I just wanted to bring up this this one fact uh, that um, by uh, March 31st, everybody, well, the 195 countries that were um, supposed to give their greenhouse emission plans to the UN, out of 195, only 33 of them um, did, and the rest got, um, you know. Uh, they, they said they were going to do it, or they haven't done it, or maybe they're going to do it at the last minute. And and so so COP 21 is 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 really when what what you know the binding agreements. So the laws are being made. So like you know, as an artist, I feel yeah, I can influence people, and that's great. But but really, uh, it has to be a law. Uh, so I feel like as artists in these like um, antennas and you know like uh, Asher does these incredible political campaigns. Courtney uh, is like super involved in you know the fine art aspect of it, um, and it's it's kind of like we know what's up and we have known it for a long time. A lot of the general public doesn't know what's up, 
So I want to, um, and I wanted to ask Andrew too to devote uh, more time to raising war awareness about COP21. Um, I am working with a bunch of grassroots, uh, 350.org and some grassroots organizations, um, doing little demos. Also, I just wanted to bring up that, you know, um, in the 70s, uh, you know, we had this amazing hippie peacenik movement um, that's been totally, you know, um, well, it's gone out the window a little bit, but I do think that people are starting to really care um, a, a lot more, or are, are a lot more aware of things, um, but uh, it's really, you know, I was talking to Asher the other day about she was feeling just preaching to the converted and how how to get it out there, and so um, I have this idea. I want to make like you know a, a biodiversity ball and have it in um, in in New York, and then in in, in Paris, um, and also surrounding that have a lot of debates. So I'm working on that, and um, I just I just really wanted to talk about COP21 and how important it is that these laws get into place and we put pressure on it and I think as artists you know we could maybe just have like the best party on the planet like maybe that's how we could uh, help raise awareness but uh, so well that's you know. not the uh, that's not a bad oh, I, idea sorry I just went on for a while but I no I it's fine um, it just seems like you know you make an excellent point that as artists it would make a great idea to try and work on a campaign specifically to bring attention to this big important political event that's happening as part of the original Kyoto Protocols and Kyoto Agreements that as you mentioned a large percentage of the US population just is blissfully unaware of. Yeah, um, I don't know. If, yeah. if, if we could um, in all of our roles and all the people watching at home uh, actually utilize our talents, our networks, our different abilities to try and draw attention to this and various other issues, there's a lot that can be done. Um, you know, anything from, say, an Instagram contest to draw attention to uh, your impact on the environment or what uh, COP21 means to you to, you know, a large-scale performance piece in front of the UN building during the actual uh, talks. You know, there's various ways that we could all get involved, and, you know, I'd love to hear your guys' ideas on Mara's perspective, or sorry, your perspective on Mara's ideas. Uh, Courtney, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think it, um, you know, the more voices, the better. So I think if, as you said, Andrew, if everyone can do what they're particularly skilled at in order to help raise awareness about climate change and um, the climate talks that are coming up, I think that we could really um, get something going and add our voices to this kind of growing movement. Um, I love the idea of having a big party full of artists. I think that would be great. Um, and I think, you know, the bigger message would really be if we could get the word out, you know, on social media and through video and all kinds of things. So, you know, I'd love to work with you ladies on something about that. Yeah, it would be fun. Asher, your thoughts? Yeah, um, adding to what Mara said, you know, in terms of mobilizing the individuals, uh, it's amazing how much of our world is in is in competition with and at odds with one another. And it's like even within the conservation community, everyone's you know almost in competition with who's going to be the first to coin a way to solve the crisis or the cause. And that's really not the way in which we should be thinking or uh, aligning ourselves to anything in this world because each of us is so different. Just the three of us here, you know, what Courtney does, I'm not doing. What she, I do, she's not doing. Mara, like we have our individual voices because the way in which we experience this life that's, that we're navigating, um, all the exposure we're, we're enduring and you know, the way in which she sees a fish is not going to be the way in which I see that fish. It's We're so specific to our configuration, and we should really appreciate this diversity and what we're each capable of doing. It's so unique to us. You know, we're all these individual filters, and we each have something to contribute. So no one should be held back on account of not knowing enough or not uh, being an artist even, because I think it's just about expression and, and taking responsibility and getting involved, just immersing yourself. Um, and, and there's always a way. 
you know, the people often let themselves off the hook, and and that's just uh, a cop out, you know. And we can't afford that come COP twenty one. We need to step up. No, I'm so, not I think more important than cop out. Yeah, COP twenty. You guys, if COP twenty one is a bust, we're we're really in trouble. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can't. And, and what and what you say is so true about like you know we need actual policy commitments. Like we need the government to like make the and, and globally we need to come together and make these like commitments to deliver uh, and 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 draw up a time frame that's tangible for that because we can't just be about you know, vague proposals and intangible promises for the distant future. These things are, have to be delivered for the for the present day, and that's the only way we're going to ensure something for tomorrow for the next generation. So I think we can't afford to just dilly dally about. There has to be immediate action. It has to involve everybody. It can't be about the marginalized factions or conservationists anymore. It's it's, it's got to be a mainstream dialogue. Every brand needs to be aware of this. Every you know, corporate entity out there should not be capitalizing and commodi commoditizing resources without being aware of the larger picture. Because we're all in it together. We have one planet. So if we screw it up, we're all screwed. It's not just you know, few of us who are going to be affected, and and the rest of us can get away with it. It's not, no one's going to get away with with the loss of life as we know it. So yeah. True. In the end, if all of your customers go away, your bottom line goes away. Mm -hmm. I think that's especially true in America because we're one of the biggest, most developed, most polluting countries and just getting people to believe in climate change is way too far behind. Like that is not even something we need to focus on. We need to know that it exists. It's a fact and we need to start acting to change it like the rest of the world because everyone else is on board and um, we need to take responsibility for the emissions that we've put out there and you know help other countries understand how to enable themselves to develop sustainably. I would argue that it's part of your guys' job as artivists to help express and resonate with the larger community than just the say scientists or climate activists that are out there because you guys have this awesome talent at your disposal of communication through visual and other means. So let's uh, take so, this so idea. Are, but you're the other means, Andrew. So like, what I want to ask you is, like, can we do some stuff that's directly related to COP21 on your channel? Yeah, obviously, of course. Anything uh, that you guys want to push through our channel, just feel free um, and let me know, and I could definitely help that out. And I have some ideas that we could uh, shoot around after this hangout. Um, which actually brings me to the point that this Hangout has been going for a little time now, and it probably is about time for final thoughts and to wrap up. Uh, so I will go down the list of uh, everybody to get your final thoughts on your work, uh, on the lines between art and conservation, and your final thoughts on this actual Hangout. Uh, Courtney, let's throw it to you first. Sure. Um, I guess I would just say that I'm glad that we're doing this, and I hope we can have more artivist hangouts. And um, I just believe that art has a really incredible power to um, inspire people to care about the natural world. And it's a way for people to understand and interpret and translate things about the natural world um, to enhance our understanding of it and enhance how much we care about protecting it and feel kind of collectively responsible for um, the future health of our planet and ourselves. So uh, I think art can go a long way in spreading that message and I'm excited to keep working on that and work with you all. Awesome. Mara, let's go to you. Oh, okay, so, um, you know, um, I, I, I'm just really into this idea of um, having the uh, biodiversity ball come from the ocean platform uh, because all biodiversity stems from the ocean and so I, I think that you know the ocean is this hidden world where most people just see its surface and it's just considered you know uh, an empty zone that covers most of the planet um, when in fact it's like you know much more exciting than going to outer space when you dive or something. Uh, well, I, not that I've been to outer space recently, but um, <laughs> yeah, maybe just in my mind. So that's it. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. And um, 
I, I'll follow up with uh, with everybody. So have a great day. Awesome. Thanks. Asher, your final thoughts? Um, my final thoughts. I am really looking forward to Mara and <laughs> Courtney and I working together on this masquerade ball. Uh, and I love costume parties. So I'm really excited about that. I'm pretty sure we've come up with some pretty interesting concepts for that. And I think it's like really interesting, you know, most of the the projects that I've come up with is simply by saying yes to collaborations like this. They're completely random, grassroots, somebody thinks of it, and then you just get on board. And you're and it's amazing to me how far I've come along my my path simply by saying yes to life and and moving forward and going where it takes you and it always does take you somewhere and you may not always know your bearings but like it doesn't take away from your participation to not know your exact bearings in regards to where like in, in terms of security in uh, where you will end up next based on where you are now you know and people always want this like trajectory that's based on on like guarantees and life is not about guarantees life is about being present and available to the largest um, you know like anything, largest faction of people or wildlife or anything. It's like being available to life at large. And I think a lot of people just close themselves off and they want to know for sure that if they study something today that it's going to result in a job tomorrow and that job will result in X amount of dollars in their bank account the next day. And it's like this constant need for linear deliverance that is just not what truly living is about. And Mara and I were just talking about that the other day in the park. Is like, you know, what happened to being happy? Not enough of us are even happy, and not enough of us are reflecting sort of a positive internal landscape on the world external. So I think who we are internally is what we end up projecting in the world around us. So unless we resolve the internal violence, the chaos, and all this like tumultuous dark energy that seems to be pervading across our planet, it's not going to disappear from the world around us. So we do need to start with each and every one of ourselves and like address who we are and how we contribute to society at large. Um, and it doesn't matter what walk of in life you're from, what industry you're from, you still have uh, impact from the moment you wake up, you know, or even when you're sleeping, when you breathe, you have impact. So you might as well be conscious of it and and realize, you know, how you can translate that impact into something more positive for this world around you. Great final thoughts on that and totally have to say that I agree. Uh, I really hope that everybody watching at home has a chance to check out the art of uh, the work of our uh, fantastic panel of artists. I want to thank all the people watching at home for watching and I want to thank all of my fantastic panelists for joining us today and I'm very much so looking forward to what's going to come about surrounding COP21 and uh, all the various other partnerships that get developed around art and conservation. So for you guys at home, make sure that whatever inspires you specifically about conservation, about protecting the world around you and interacting with the world around you, that you express it in whatever means you have available to you. And don't forget to get in the water at some time. Until next time, this is the Online Ocean Symposium signing off. Thank you.